Our study tonight is the study of Hezekiah and his loyalty to God. We're going to look at we're going to look at just a couple of uh, matters by way of introduction with Hezekiah, and then I want us to focus on a section of the 18th chapter uh, that begins in verse 17. And it's a very, it's a fairly lengthy reading, but uh, we're going to uh, we're going to go all the way through um, verse thirty six. So in just a moment, we'll read verses seventeen through thirty six. Uh, for the main reason is to to familiarize ourselves with the text, because the the main body of our study tonight will come directly from that text. And as you see, as you see, the, the title of our study tonight is Hezekiah, Rabshakeh, and the Misrepresentations of False Religionists. Hezekiah, Rabshakeh, and the Misrepresentation of False Religionists. All right, so let's begin, first of all, by thinking about, thinking about Hezekiah. You can, put your, you can kind of put your mark there in chapter 18, not necessary. Why don't you turn back to chapter 16 as we think about Hezekiah and his, his uh, ascension to the throne uh, in Judah. And one thing that I want us to, to think about as we think about Hezekiah is that, and this is on your handout, that Hezekiah did not allow his poor upbringing to hinder him from serving God. In other words, his... his for lack of a better term, his sorry, the sorry household in which he lived was not used as an excuse not to serve God. His father was Ahaz. Ahaz was absolutely one of the worst kings ever in the history of Judah. Uh, probably, probably only exceeded in his, in his wickedness by Manasseh. But we see at, in the Chronicles how at the end of his life, Manasseh repented. And so I would not put him above Manasseh, uh, or, 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 I would not put Manasseh above him as being wicked because at least Manasseh repented at the end of his life and Ahaz never did. But what do we find, what do we find the Bible tells us uh, about, about Ahaz? And as you think about uh, verse 2 through 4, that Ahaz practiced idolatry and wickedness. Uh, look in verse 2. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Indeed, he made his son... Pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Now that phrase made them pass through the fire is likely, and, and, and Ted, if I'm wrong, correct me. But my understanding is that he practiced the worship of Molech. And the worship of Molech was, uh, was, a, was a, a, a ritualistic worship that required child sacrifice. And if my study and, and, and memory serves me correctly, that Molech was a, obviously was a, 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 a graven image whose hands were stretched outward like this. And the fire would be built underneath, the, it would probably be made out of bronze or iron or something of that nature. The fires would be built underneath the hands until the hands were red hot with searing heat. And the babies would be placed on those open hands and burned to death, basically on a, on a giant frying pan. On a giant frying pan. And so, uh, and, and, and associated with that uh, was a lot of loud music, cymbals being drums, cymbals, and noises. Oftentimes, it was said, it was only played to quiet or cover the screams 
of the mothers as their children were being sacrificed. And it says here that he made his son pass through the fire. And so, and so he, was, he was a king who practiced um, the worst of idolatry, the worst of wickedness in idolatry. Ahaz practiced those practiced those things. Also in verses 10 through 14, he mimicked the worship of the heathens. He mimicked the worship of the heathens. In verse 10 it says, Now Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent Urijah the priest, the the design of the altar and its pattern according to all its workmanship. Then Urijah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent to Damascus. So Urijah the priest came or made it before King Ahaz came back from Damascus. And when the king came back from Damascus, the king saw the altar and the king approached the altar and made offerings on it. And he burned his burnt offering and his grain offering and he poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings on the altar. He mimicked the worship. He mimicked the worship of the heathens. This again, this is Hezekiah's, this is Hezekiah's father. And then finally in verse 15 through verse 18, we see that not only did he mimic the worship of the heathens, he destroyed the worship of God. That is the worship according to the law. Then King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest saying, On the great new altar burn the morning burnt offering and the evening grain offering, the king's burnt sacrifice and his grain offering with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, their grain offering and their drink offering and sprinkle on it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice and the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. He destroyed the worship that God had set forth for His people. And says it will be for Him to inquire by. In other words, they would make sacrifice to, they would make sacrifice to these heathen gods in an attempt to get these gods to speak to them and guide them in the things that they should do. And the Bible says, and King, verse 17, and King Ahaz cut off the panels of the carts and removed the lavers from them. And he took down the sea from the bronze oxen that were under it and put it on a pavement of stones. And he removed the Sabbath pavilion which they had built in the temple. And he removed the king's outer entrance from the house of the Lord on account of the king of Assyria. So not only, not only did he replace the altar of God, with an altar of the heathen, he took the items that belonged to the worship of God and destroyed them in his practice of idolatry. This was, this was the example that Hezekiah had. But he did not allow his sorry influence or the sorry influence of his father to, to, to sway him from serving the Lord. You know, some of us can relate to not having good influences in our homes. I'm one of those people. Is Ann, Ann's not here, is she? No, wrong Ann. Ann West. Ann West needs to hear this story. When my dad was a senior in high school, this would have been in December of 1965 or January of 1966. My, my folks graduated high school in 66. When my dad was a senior in high school, he had a Jeep. And one day, or one night, in Dexter, Missouri, it snowed about six or eight inches. And my dad wanted to ride his Jeep in the snow, but the problem was school hadn't been called off. So my dad called the local television station and told him that he was T.S. Hill, who was the superintendent of Dexter Schools. And he called off school. Now, top that way. My dad called off school. Alright? Now, 
there were a lot of the same teachers in Dexter High School when I got to high school. Some, we had the same English teacher. Had a number of the same, same teachers in high school. Invariably, first day of school, roll call. Todd Clipper. Is your dad Joe Clipper? Yes, ma'am. Did you know? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I know. My dad called off school in 1965. Yes, ma'am, I know that. I started off high school behind the eight ball. Now, look, I wasn't many steps above my old man when I got to high school. I never managed to call off school, but I did a lot of other foolish things. But some of us understand what it's like to grow up in a household without good influences. But that is no excuse. That is no excuse for us to live like our parents have lived. And Hezekiah did not allow allow his father to influence him for evil. Also, with, with regard to Hezekiah, he was a great reformer. Everything that Ahaz did to institute idol worship and destroy the worship of God, Hezekiah did the opposite. He did everything he could to restore the worship of God and destroy the worship of the heathen. The Bible says in in several places that Hezekiah, he tore down all the high places. In other words, every place where there was idolatrous practices going on, he destroyed those places. He restored the worship of God. It had been so long since people had observed the law of God, that Hezekiah, they discovered the law of God and realized they hadn't been observing the Passover. And he wanted more than anything to restore the worship, to restore the worship of God. And by the way, that's not the only time that happened in, in the history of Judah. It also happened during the reign of Josiah. Where, where Josiah, disco- they discovered the law and figured out they hadn't been doing as God wanted them to do. But to the best of his ability. He undid everything that his father had done and restored the worship of God. The Bible says no king before him and none after him served God God with the diligence that Hezekiah did. So it was a great great example uh, for us of his loyalty to God and his faithfulness to God. But I want us to focus on a section in in this account wherein the king of Assyria comes in and he is going to plunder, he's going to plunder the children of Israel. And, uh, and, and it said, begins in, well, Hezekiah basically tried, as great and loyal as he was, he tried to bribe the king of Assyria. He tried to pay him off to leave Judah alone. And as it often would times be the case, It it worked, but only for a little while. They came back for more. And that was the case here in 2 Kings 18, beginning in verse 17. And it says, Then the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh from Lachish, with a great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they had come up, they went and stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool, which was on the highway to the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to them. Then the Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? You speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt, which on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altar Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria. 
And I will give you 2,000 horses, if you're able on your part, to put riders on them. How then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Have I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. And do not speak to us in Hebrew, in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words, and not to the men who sit on the wall, who will eat and drink their own waste with you? Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and spoke, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you from his hand, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present, and come out to me, and every one of you will eat from his own vine, and every one his own fig tree, and every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves and honey, that you may live and not die. But do not listen to Hezekiah, lest he persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharim and Hena and Iva? Indeed, they have delivered Samaria have they delivered Samaria from my hand? And who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. But the people held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was, do not answer him. Now, I want us to think about some things that this man said to the people of Egypt and draw some parallels to the way he presented his case to God's people and the way that, for lack of a better term, false religionists present their case to the people and oftentimes God's people. So let's go back through the text. Look at verses 21 and 22. 21 and 22. In verse uh, 21 says, You are trusting in this broken reed of Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. And so is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he who has taken those high places and altars away? Now think about this. False religionists misrepresent true religion. They misrepresent true religion. Think about this. Did Hezekiah take away the high places? Most certainly he did. Did he restore, did he restore the worship of God? He most certainly did. But see, the Rabshakeh misread the situation. He thought that the people would have been upset at what Hezekiah had done. See, he was, playing on, he was playing on their, for lack of a better term, their baser affections. In other words, surely they miss all of this idolatrous uh, practice. They miss all the things associated with it. And I'm going, to, I'm going to present to them the idea that Hezekiah has not indeed done the will of the Lord. And so they misrepresented the true religion of the people of God. First of all, uh, false religionists uh, misrepresent our faith. They misrepresent our faith. They say, in, uh, do you trust in Egypt? 
You know, as the Rabshakeh said, do you trust in Egypt? They ask us, sir, well, do, you trust, do you trust in this? For example, do you trust in baptism? You know, do, you trust in, do you trust in having the right name on your church building? Do you trust in, in the worship in which you participate? They misrepresent, they misrepresent our faith. Moreover, they misrepresent us as legalists. I began to hear all this talk about legalism back in the late 80s and early 90s. It's, it's really, and I, I don't know if anybody else, I, I guess I could ask Ted, we don't hear a lot about legalism anymore, at least I don't, but you know, from the, through the 90s and early 2000s, you know, as, 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 as sections or factions within the church began to separate themselves, uh, from us, they would refer to us as legalists. And what they meant was is that you trust in your own works to save you. But that's not true. No, nobody I know trusts in their own works to save them. Now, there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference in trusting in your works to save you and also understanding that there are things that we have to do in order to be saved. Just because I do those things doesn't mean I trust in those things, right? I don't, tr I don't trust in the law to save me, the law of Moses, or the law of Christ. I don't trust in the deeds that I don't trust in the deeds that are, are that are given to us in the text. I trust in the God who gave us the deeds. And so when when I do what God says, I trust in God that He's going to do what He said He would do. And so every you know everything that we do, whether it be in obey, for example, in obedience to the plan of salvation, you know. It amazes, it amazes me, it amazes me how many, how many of our religious friends and neighbors, they'll walk right with us, even though they won't agree on the order. They'll walk, they'll walk side by side with us in faith and repentance and confession. Where's the road split, John? Right there at the water. That's right. We're going to park company at the water. And they're going to say, you're trusting you're trusting in this act to save you when nothing could be further from the truth. I trust in God to save me. And why do I trust God to save me? Because God said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Yeah. I trust in the same God that, that Ananias spoke, spoke of in, in Acts 9 and Acts 22. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now look, if there were ever a passage that, that illustrates that our faith is in God and not in baptism, it's got to be Colossians 2, 11 and 12. That we are buried with Him in baptism and raised through faith in the work of God who raised Jesus from the dead. There's no faith in the water. There's no faith in the act. It's all faith in God. By the way, I repent because I have faith in the one who told me i got to repent. Isn't that right? I confess my faith in Jesus because of the one who told me I've got to confess my faith in Jesus. There's not a particle of difference in, in my faith in God with regard to my belief in Christ, my repentance, my confession, and my being baptized. Which another, let me, let me just mention one other thing, and, and you've probably heard this illustration before. But of all the things that God has commanded us to be saved, we can do all of them. Now, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here, all right? Of all the things that God has commanded us to do to be saved, we can do all of them on our own, except for one. Isn't that right? I mean, I can read the Bible and come to faith in Jesus Christ, right? I can read the Bible and, and understand I've got to repent of, of my sins and change the way that I'm living. I can read my Bible 
and understand I've got to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, Romans 10, 9 and 10, but I cannot baptize myself. Of all the things I'm commanded to do, there's one I cannot do that has to be done to me and for me. And it always amazes me that, that, that our religious friends and neighbors say, that's the work that you're trusting in. And I'm like, I'm not doing anything. I'm just I'm submitting to a thing. And so the, you know, the one thing we're commanded to do that we can't do for ourselves is be baptized. And that's the one thing where all of our religious friends and neighbors want to part, want to part company with us. But they misrepresent, they misrepresent true religion. We do not trust in the law or our works to say. We trust in the God who commanded those things. All right? So that's number one. Then secondly, false religionists equate numbers with strength. In verse 23 and 24, you know, uh, the Rabshakeh was so confident, he said, we'll give y'all 2,000 horses. Which, by the way, was a serious matter for, for, for battle in those days. He said, and even if you could find 2,000 guys to ride them, we're not worried. We'll give you 2,000 horses, you find 2,000 riders, and we're still not going to break a sweat killing y'all. That's basically what he's saying. In other words, our numbers are overwhelming. Our strength is overwhelming. Our power is overwhelming. But the strength of God's people has never been found in the numbers. Isn't that right? I mean, when God, call, when God called Israel, and, he, and, and, and as Moses was reminding the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 7, said, God did not choose you because you were a great nation. He did not choose you because you were a, 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 a massive population of people. He said, God chose you because you were the least. You were the least. And ev certainly every single army they would have faced in the promised land would have been larger than them. And more powerful than them. You know, having, you know, for example, even during the days of David, you know, the Philistines were the, were the iron workers. You know, they had all the armaments. They had all, and yet, what did God say? He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let one of you chase ten and ten of you chase a thousand. What's that tell, what does that tell Israel? You're vastly outnumbered. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the battle. But people in the religious world, they, they, they misunderstand or misapply the idea of numbers with strength. I mean, you think about, you know, just since I, I've lived here, I'm in, well, this is my 27th year preaching here. And there, there, are churches, there are churches in this, and I'll say this community, I'll just say in the, in the Hamilton or Marion County area, there are, there, are, there are churches in this area now that did not exist when I got here, right? Buildings have gone up. Uh, churches have been, uh, have been established. Some of them have had great numbers of people affiliate themselves with them, either in Hamilton or Winfield or some other places that, that I could think of, or you know, out on 43 South. And, and what do they all say? Look how we're growing. The Lord is blessing us. You know, if, if God wasn't happy with us, certainly we couldn't have this many people. And so their faith, is in the, their faith is in the number of adherents that they have and not in whether or not they're doing what God wants them to do. As Michael Shepard said one time, the church has never been found in the book of Numbers. It's always found in the book of Acts. And so to, 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 mis to misunderstand the idea that just because you've got a lot of people that God's blessing you is exactly what the Rab Shaka was saying. He says, we're far more powerful than you. God's not been blessing you. And so false religionists equate or, or misunderstand uh, numbers uh, with, with strength. I mean, how many examples? With, how about Gideon? I mean... Is there, is there a better example than Gideon? <laughs> is there a better example than Gideon of how you don't need a lot of people if God wants you to win the battle? And by the way, when we get to the end of this account, we, we didn't actually read it. 
because it doesn't happen until the next chapter. God, God, gave, God gave Judah a great victory here with Hezekiah, and they didn't even so much as lift a finger. They didn't even lift a finger. And so, and so the idea that numbers is equal to strength, I remember one time, I remember one time the, a church where I was was having some difficulty and, and some folks were leaving. And uh, one of the elders asked, asked one of our new converts, he said, what do you think about that? He said, leaner's meaner. You know, and sometimes that's true, isn't it? Sometimes leaner is meaner. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes the church has to, has to, needs to suffer some losses in order to, to truly show, show its uh, strength. All right, then number three, false religionists misrepresent the Lord's guidance. Look at verse 25. Reb Shekin says, Have I come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up to this land and destroy it. Now, did the Lord tell him any such thing? Why, well, no. The Lord didn't tell him to go up there and, and, and destroy, uh, destroy Judah. But think about this. How many times do we hear people on the radio or television say, The Lord said to me. You know, I was praying the other night, and the Lord said to me, I was in dreaming in the night, and the Lord said to me. Always interesting to me how many people the Lord talking to nowadays. Yeah, he's talking to a lot of people, isn't he? And here's another thing I don't understand. Why is he talking to this one over here and telling him one thing, and he's talking to this one over here and telling him the opposite thing? I had never figured that one out. Now, don't get me wrong. The Lord's talking to us today. We just got to listen. But he's talking to us through this. He, he speaks to us through the Bible. And we have to listen to what he says by reading and studying our Bible. So the Lord is talking to us, but not like, not like most of the people uh, in the world are saying so. And, and by the way, oh, look, just here on your handout, I had a couple of, I had a couple of uh, examples. Yeah, I can remember in 2003, you know, the Episcopal Church had a big convention and and openly uh, ordained, or, uh, ordained an openly homosexual bishop in the state of New Hampshire. And they presumably did so with the guidance of the Lord. And then you have uh, 2015, the Presbyterian Church of the USA uh, votes to change the definition of marriage to include homosexuality, all under the guise or the guidance of God. By the way, I didn't bring it with me, but I've got a bulletin. I've got a bulletin from a church in Hamilton that was given to me by a member of that church where the, where the female bishop, who apparently has never read 1 Timothy chapter 3, made the statement that that church could change any of their laws by a vote of the convention. They could change any of their laws by a vote of the convention. And by the way, and they all will, they will all say the convention, the convention is guided by the Holy Spirit, wouldn't it? They say whatever happens in this convention is the will of God. Is that what they say? Now let me ask you this question. If what happens in the convention is the will of God, then why doesn't everybody vote the same? It, seemed, it would seem to make sense to me that everybody ought to vote the same. Or at least the people who didn't get their way with the vote ought to accept, ought to accept the results of the vote and change the way that they think. But is that what they do? No, that's not what they do. I got in trouble a few years ago when they were picking a pope. I was writing in the house to house, heart to heart, and in the local paper. I said, you know, they only took one vote to pick an apostle. In Acts chapter one, isn't that right? They took one vote. And then they take vote after vote after vote after vote. You know, and then eventually if you were a Pope candidate and you didn't get enough votes, they booed you out. You know, they started weeding you out. You know, and, and you had to look at yeah, you had to look at the Vatican every day to see what color smoke is coming out of the stovepipe. You know, and it was it the white smoke that means you got a pope? White, you, know, you got brown smoke for days and days and days and days and vote after vote after vote after vote, and then finally. You get white smoke. 
And it just seemed to me that in the minds of those folks, the Pope's far more important than an apostle because the Pope sits in the place of Christ. And it takes vote after vote after vote after vote to pick a replacement. And they're going to tell you that whole process is guided by God. Look, anybody can see through a ladder knows better than that. I mean, let, let, I mean just, just on its face, it screams God is not a part of this. It just screams God is not a part of this. So they misrepresent themselves as being guided uh, by the Lord. Number four, false religionists misrepresent what they have to offer. Look in verse 31 and 32. The king of Assyria said, look, y'all just agree to come over with me and I'll let you live your lives and eat, drink, and be merry. And then when I get ready for you, I'll come and get you and you'll be living it up. You'll be living it up in Assyria. Just like you are here, but you'll just be over there. Isn't that what he said? He said, all, you, all you're going to do is just move. You're not going to be slaves or anything. You're not going to be servants or anything. I just want you to move from where you live over to where I live. And there's bread and vineyards and, and all types of things to eat. It, it, look, it's a paradise. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that's really how it was going to be when they got to Assyria? Yeah. Do a little study. Do a little study on how the Assyrians treated their prisoners. By the way, you can look up some of these things uh, in, uh, online uh, in the, uh, the British Museum. There is a wall, there's a, a long wall relief in, the London, in London in the British Museum that depicts how the Assyrians treated their prisoners. You know, we might think, of, like, for example, if you hear the term chain gang, you think about guys that are all connected to a chain and everybody's got a shackle on basically on one leg, right? The guy behind you's got a shackle on his leg, and the guy behind you got a shackle on his leg. Well, the, the Assyrians had a chain game. Except rather than have a shackle around your ankle, they had a jaw hook. And they ran a hook all the way through your jaw. In and out. And that's how you were connected to the guy behind you, who also had a jaw hook. You know, you'd want to make sure everybody stepped real lightly, wouldn't you? If you're going to walk 600 miles with a jaw hook, you know, in your head. There, there's pictures of them, of them literally skinning Israelites alive. You can see it. They skin those men alive in front of women and children. This is all depicted on the wall relief of Sennacherib. Of Sennacherib. They misrepresented, they misrepresented what they had to offer to the, to, to the people of God. Now think about this. People, uh, for example, in 2 Peter 2, 18 and 19, speaking of these false teachers, it says, They promise liberty, but they are slaves to corruption. You have the quote at the top. This is just something to say. We have personal and religious liberty. We don't judge. You know, that, will not, that won't last very long anywhere. Look, people are going to make a judgment at some point, at some point in time. Nobody, nobody lives their lives completely free of making any type of judgment. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 2.13, They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and dug cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. You know, why, don't, why are our brethren so enamored with what's going on in the religious world at large? I don't understand it. What did God say about them? He says those things are broken cisterns. There's no water there. There's nothing to drink in a broken cistern. You know, you're just you're wasting your time and energy. And then lastly, this in verses 33 through 35, it says, We learn that false religionists make false comparisons. They make false comparisons. In this particular case, the Rabshakeh was comparing the God of heaven to the gods of the nations that he had already conquered. So because he had conquered a number of idolatrous nations whose gods could not deliver them, as Isaiah said, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't talk, they can't even walk. You've got to pick them up and move them. Those gods can't deliver. 
The Rabshakeh made the mistake of believing that the God that Judah served was no better than the God that the gods that the Canaanites served. Which brings us to the end of the story. In one night, when Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, the prophet came to him. This way I described it. 185,000 Assyrians woke up dead one morning. In one night, God sent an angel who killed 185,000 Assyrians in a night and none of them made so much as a peep. By the way, Sennacherib wrote what is called, called Sennacherib's or Taylor's Prison, which was a record of, for example, all of his military conquests that, we, that he spoke about here, and Lachish, which was also destroyed. And on Taylor's Prism, here are the words of Sennacherib. I have Hezekiah, king of Judah, caged like a bird. Now, the text tells us that, that the Assyrians came and sieged Jerusalem. But, but Sennacherib counted his chickens before they hatched. Because he may have thought he had Hezekiah caged like a bird, but God wiped out nearly 200,000 of his soldiers in a single night. Sennacherib packed up and went home. Never any word that he had conquered Hezekiah, because he didn't. And it was so bad, and it's even recorded in the pages of Scripture, he went home with such an embarrassing defeat that his own children murdered him when he got home. The defeat at the hand, I'm going to say this, at the hands of Judah, but we all know, we all know who did it, right? The, his, his defeat at the hands of the living God was such a massive defeat, his own sons murdered him. When he got home. But Hezekiah was loyal. Now Hezekiah wasn't perfect. We've already noted that he, he stripped the, the house of God. And tried to bribe the Assyrians. You know, no man is perfect. But just because a man is not perfect. Does not mean he's not loyal. You know, I know. Don't let, Rhonda, don't let Rhonda hear that I admitted this. I know I'm not a perfect husband. Do not tell her I said that. I don't want to ruin it for her. But I, but I believe it'd be, be safe for me to, to say that I, I'm a loyal and faithful husband. And that's, the kind of, that's, that's what Hezekiah teaches us. That we'll not be perfect, but we can be loyal and we can be faithful. And God, and God will deliver us, God will deliver us uh, when, we are, when we are loyal and faithful. We're behind on a bell. Who's got the bell? I, I need... I need four or five minutes so that Blake can gather up the, the, uh, the slips. He's on his way. But, but everybody here, you're, consider yourselves dismissed. Do whatever you need to do over the next four or five minutes.